Welcome to the uh, easel viral hepatitis uh, debrief of the ILC 2017. So we, we are happy with uh, Professor Aina Wedemeyer uh, and myself to uh, present you the best of the uh, easel uh, ILC viral hepatitis. We would like to, to acknowledge uh, all presenters providing slides and Munya and Masson for, for the support. Um, and now we, we, we have seen a lot of presentations at, uh, at easel um, on viral hepatitis. Mm -hmm. So, Aina, what, what do you think about the evolution of, uh, of the field of viral hepatitis? Yeah, so on, on this slide I've been putting my personal view of selection of abstracts for highlight presentation over the last 10 years uh, during liver con conferences. And obviously, uh, two or three, four years ago, this was, these were hepatitis C meetings, largely dominated after the approval of the first and second generation of direct acting antivirals. Um, now we have maybe partially solved the clinical problem of viral efficacy, um, and therefore other topics become of interest. And I think this year um, at the International Liver Congress 2017, we see uh, a rise in interest in hepatitis B, but also of the other viruses. And uh, we will come back at the very end of this debrief uh, what might be the future uh, of viral hepatitis for liver conferences. Um, so we are talking about viral hepatitis. Hepatitis B, C, D was uh, in, on the agenda. But the alphabet starts with A. Uh, and we rarely had uh, hepatitis abstracts uh, on, on HAV. Um, I've been looking through the program, Fabien, uh, and um, actually we, we all know that acute hepatitis um, is caused by HAV. We have no chronicity. We have vaccines and there have been plenty of data presented uh, over the last years and published um, that uh, this HAV vaccine is uh, extremely effective. But we see also data during this meeting from Korea, for example, and from China that the epidemiology of viral hepatitis A is changing. In particular, the younger population, uh, persons between 30 and 40, have less frequently been exposed during childhood and they become maybe a vulnerable population. And this may become of relevance even for European populations in the future when we consider that there are patients with other chronic liver diseases and if these patients catch A, if they become super infected, maybe there is a risk for decompensation for acute and chronic liver failure. And there is data for me at this meeting from Thailand, so a high endemic area, um, they analyzed 1,400 patients um, with acute hepatitis A. They were collected in almost 350 hospitals, and then they looked for all-cause mortality in this case. And there were patients dying, uh, and what is important to note, patients were more likely to die if they were old, if they had cirrhosis at baseline. Um, and if they had other chronic liver diseases. And I think this highlights that we should not forget about A. There may be uh, something to be considered even for European countries. I don't know whether you have observed the, this phenomenon in Lyon. We had Hanover. Maybe we have overlooked this. I don't know what your opinion is. Uh, I, I think you're, you're right, Aina. This is a very uh, uh, interesting observation. and, and, and uh, uh, clearly things that we are overlooking this, this aspect and we should be more careful about it. I, uh, and I, co I completely agree. And the one virus we've been overlooking was A and, and the I other one was E, obviously. So, and so wh what do you think about all the evolution on, on hepatitis E? Were there a lot of new things? So hepatitis E is emerging. Uh, I have to announce that there will be also new easel clinical practice guidelines on hepatitis E, hopefully released later this year. We have been had a long uh, session yesterday in preparing them, but also during this meeting there was quite some data. Um, we know that the virus usually causes acute hepatitis, but that chronicity may emerge in immunocompromised patients. And there's also data, for example, from Thailand that there not only in France, but also in, in other countries like Asia, chronic hepatitis E may occur. Um, then there has been discussion what 
type of immunosuppression is causing chronic hepatitis E. Uh, again, from France, interesting data that tyrosine kinase inhibitors may also be associated with chronicity. So there has been data also from France again that tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, may be associated with chronic infection, which I found interesting. Um, what we know that uh, severe causes can be observed in patients with chronic hepatitis. This is data from India, but also an abstract presented from Switzerland. Uh, this year showed that uh, acute on chronic E may be associated even with mortality. I think quite interesting. Um, what is also something we need to understand in future, if HEV genotype 1 in India takes a different course than HEV genotype three that we observe here mainly in Europe. And there is also data in uh, cell culture models suggesting that these viruses really behave differently, not only from a clinical perspective, but also in, in cell culture. So how do we catch HEV? We catch it by um, eating pork as a zoonosis, but, and this is in my view a big concern, we may catch HEV also by blood transfusions. There have been increasing reports from England, uh, from France, from the Netherlands, but also from Germany. One um, abstract here, and my colleagues from Germany will be most likely shocked because the frequency of HEV RNA positive blood donations was rather high with one out of 896 donations being HEV RNA positive. This is a magnitude higher than we have been anticipating before. So I was really worried by this, uh, by this study from Hamburg uh, led by Sven Pischke. Um, so the question then is how to catch HEV. Uh, and we're all aware that HEV is a zoonosis. So you can uh, consume pork, uh, undercooked uh, pig meat, and then you can catch HEV. But uh, an increasing concern is that also blood transfusions may be a significant cause for HIV infection. This has been shown in a landmark paper from the UK. There have been reports from France, from the Netherlands. And at this meeting, the Hamburg group around Sven Pischke reported their experience in screening blood products in northern Germany. And I'm from northern Germany. I was shocked from here, uh, seeing that almost one out of 900 blood transfusions tested HIV RNA positive. So. Um, I think in, in many countries uh, uh, we should really consider screening uh, blood products for HIV at least when given uh, to patients at risk. The good news is we can do something. Rubber virin is effective. This has been shown, but not in every patient. Um, so uh, there's data from the Netherlands that rubber virin worked in most, but not all patients. And again, if you use tyrosine kinase inhibitors, then in four patients, in three out of the four, uh, rubavirin failed uh, in data from France. So this is something to be watched. The, the last point regarding HEV is certainly that it may cause extrahepatic manifestations. We have a nice review in the Journal of Hepatology by six authors published just recently. Um, and at this meeting, uh, Harry Dalton presented very interesting data on the role of HEV in neurological injury. Um, and they uh, had four uh, hospital centers in the Netherlands, in Toulouse, and two in the UK. And they prospectively screened uh, neurological patients um, uh, who showed up um, in the respective clinics for HEV markers. And they identified 11 subjects with current or recent HEV infection. And what was uh, really striking that in particular cases with neuralgic amyotrophy, um, were more likely to be HEV infected. In fact, in this series, three out of five individuals were HEV RNA positive. And uh, in a subsequent presentation from the UK, um, the characteristics of this HEV-associated neuralgic amyotrophy have been characterized, um, and they were different, actually, from non-HEV neuralgic uh, amyotrophy. And Harry Dalton is claiming maybe we have misclassified this, misnamed this virus. It's not necessarily a hepatitis virus, but it's also a virus causing neurological diseases. So in summary, I think HEV 
um, is emerging. We see also data on cell culture models, on the effects of interferons, on new mode of actions. Um, and uh, I think we have to watch the field very closely, in my view. Um, uh, what we need are alternative treatment options for those patients that fail rabavirin because in distinct patients it can be really serious. So Fabian, this was my HEV summary, summary, but many people are obviously interested in B and C, and you take B. So what was hot and new regarding hepatitis B? Okay, so one of the first question that, that is really uh, clinically relevant is, uh, since we know that I in most patients we can achieve viral suppression, mm -hmm. Uh, whether they are, they are chronic hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, uh, and we know that in these patients we will improve the inflammation and maybe fibrosis, but the risk of liver cancer, uh, although it decreases, still remains. And one of the questions that uh, everybody has is whether if we would go beyond viral suppression and be able to lose uh, HBS antigen, what would be the impact uh, on liver cancer. So is it really helping? So we, we had some uh, interesting presentations from uh, the Hong Kong group. Mm -hmm. um, they, they did a, a very nice study and they, they look at the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in patients who, who cleared HBS antigen. So they had a, a large series of, of patients, more than 4,000 uh, patients, and they look at the cumulative risk of HCC development after HBS zero clearance, and they show that five years uh, after um, uh, observation, the, uh, the risk of liver cancer was 1.5%. So the estimated annual risk was 0.3% after, um, after HBS clearance. So they, they look in, in more detail because then you say, well, that's the overall uh, number. Uh, now they look at um, uh, gender, um, uh, and age. Uh, um, so they, what they found is that, on, you, you see on, on that slide, that the uh, highest, highest risk uh, of developing HCC after HBS clearance occurs if you are, uh, if you are a male uh, um, above the age of 50 years. Uh, and the lowest risk is uh, when you, you clear HBS antigen and you're a female below the age of 50. So the, the take-home message here is that if we achieve HBS clearance, we should do it uh, as early as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is important data for drug development in terms of endpoint, right? Exactly. So this is really, really uh, important. And, uh, so we, uh, and that was really a, a, a study that was information that was missing in the field. And I think this is really providing uh, a really a new insight for, for uh, clinical development in the future. Um, so th th these were data on the uh, natural history um, um, of HBS clearance. So, so now they, they are very important uh, data that were presented uh, at, at this meeting regarding the durability of HBS antigen loss in patients who were treated with nucleoside or nucleotide analogs uh, and pegylated interferon. Um, so in, in that study, uh, again, uh, Henry Chan lo looked really carefully um, at the um, uh, durability of HBS loss in patients who ach achieve or not anti-HBS seroconversion, because that, that's one of the questions, do we need anti-HBS seroconversion or, or not? And um, what they showed, it's really interesting, is that if you take uh, stringent criteria where HBS antigen loss is confirmed uh, uh, at least 24 weeks after treatment cessation, mm -hmm. then uh, the risk of um, zero reversion is minimal, whatever the um, uh, profile of anti-S antibody. Mm -hmm. So it means that uh, if HBS antigen loss is confirmed um, uh, after treatment cessation, um, then there will be a minimal risk of uh, um, of zero reversion. So this is also very important in terms of uh, treatment endpoint definition. Yeah, I completely agree. Now, I mean, what can we do with the currently available drugs um, to do better, to achieve HBS uh, antigen loss or, or to stop treatment? Mm -hmm. So there were many studies uh, on uh, um, nucleoside analog uh, withdrawal, 
um, done in, in, in Asia, in Germany. And at this meeting, there was a very interesting study presented by, uh, by the, the group in, in Greece, uh, where they, they um, carefully selected patients who are E-antigen negative, uh, non-serotic, uh, were under uh, vowel suppression with, with stenophobia therapy. And then they decided to, to stop treatment. And what they, they showed is that the, the risk of um, relapse of HBV DNA depends on the, the baseline uh, level of HBV DNA, so prior to uh, initiation uh, of treatment, but also on the um, uh, liver fibrosis stage at the beginning of treatment uh, which was assessed by, by FibroScan. So this may help to, to, to identify select patients uh, for, for whom we will propose to, to stop treatment. And I think this is an important and emerging topic and also the new HPV guidelines, the ESA guidelines, which were released yesterday. Uh, for the first time, they at least give us the option to stop nukes, even in E-negative patients, right? Yes. Exactly. So, uh, and I think this type of studies will we, we, we will help clinicians to say, well, uh, in which patients I will try to propose that. And obviously, in in that study, and this was also mentioned in the guidelines, we really need to be very careful uh, after treatment cessation. A, a very close monitoring of the patient is is mandatory. Yeah. So, so the message to you um, watching this uh, conference summary is certainly do not stop now in every patient. Uh, but the good news is uh, in selected patients stopping is possible. Exactly. Yeah. So then there were uh, studies on uh, um, trying to, to improve the uh, 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 success rate of, uh, of treatment with, with the drugs that are available. So, so one of the, um, the question is when we have patients who are uh, uh, on uh, nucleoside analogs, vowel suppression. Um, can we add interferon, switch to, to interferon? Uh, what, what is the best strategy to, to achieve um, HPS antigen reduction or HPS antigen loss? So there was a, a, a nice study um, presented by, by a, a group in Singapore where they, they did, um, uh, they compared patients who continued nucleoside analogs or did an add-on with pe pegylated interferon or switch to pegylated interferon. And the uh, results were, were interesting in terms of HBS antigen loss. Um, um, the add-on strategy and the switch arm uh, were superior to continuing uh, nucleoside analogs. But this, in the switch arm, there were more virological and clinical relapse uh, which was kind of expected because not all patients respond to interferon. So when you stop, there will be a, a, a rebound of um, uh, replication. So the study is still ongoing, but these are interesting studies. Um, maybe in the future we'll be able to identify patients that will be um, will most benefit of, of this combination or, or, or switch strategy. So now we we have learned also a lot about. Um, uh, the immunopathology of, uh, of the disease. And um, this is not only basic science, it has also clinical implication. And we've seen that at the easel, uh, uh, in the ESL guidelines that this, this better uh, knowledge of the uh, Im HPV immune responses has led to new definition uh, of the disease. So now we don't talk about uh, immune tolerant patients anymore. Okay, yeah. uh, they are in a non-inflammatory phase, so they are chronic infection with uh, HBE positivity, high vowel load, uh, uh, and normal ALT. So, uh, which leaves the possibility in some of these patients to be treated. So right. this has opened uh, uh, really possibility of, of, of more treatment in, in our patients. So, if, so basic science can really trans translate to, to, to some interesting uh, findings in clinics. So after the ILC 2017, we should no longer use the term immune tolerant HPV? Exactly. So uh, please know. avoid this term and the it, new exactly. guidelines avoid immune tolerance. Yes. So all, all this is explained in the guidelines and, and you can find the literature on this So on, what on do, the, do the immune cells then do if they are no, not tolerant? Yeah. <laughs> well, so there, there were questions about um, uh, whether HBV uh, is uh, uh, seen by the uh, innate sensors, so uh, 
um, and whether it uh, suppresses innate immunity or not. And there was a nice study from there is a group in, in Basel in Switzerland uh, looking at um, um, biopsies from chronically infected patients. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, 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 they look at the uh, um, capacity of this uh, uh, infected hepatocyte to produce interferon um, upon stimulation. Um, so they, they, they showed very, very nicely uh, that HBV infection does not prevent interferon induction in the liver and does not suppress interferon stimulated gene in induction. So that, that's a very nice ex vivo study. Um, then we, now we have to, to work on understanding what is happening and how we could overcome uh, the, immune or, or the overall immune defect uh, in, in these patients. So there were also um, very interesting studies on the characterization of the uh, uh, exhausted T cells yeah. in, in chronically infected patients. Many studies, we don't have time to, to go in detail, um, but some really compared uh, what's happening in HBV versus HCV infection. Um, and the group of um, uh, Freiburg sh showed that this um, uh, in HBV, the HBV specific CD8 T cells, they, they have a, a, a very interesting profile of uh, uh, expression of uh, um, especially TCF1, uh, which uh, can lead to some perspective in, in terms of immune manipulation. So the cells are not completely dead, and these markers suggest that they may be targetable, correct? Exactly. Yeah. And this also comes back to the, the situation of the immune-tolerant yeah. patients that we, we called in the past immune-tolerant. They, they, they are not yeah. completely immune-tolerant. And the interesting part of that one is that this HPV cells are different from the HCV-specific uh, CD8 T cells. Exactly. Which would then be in line with Carlo Ferrari's data he yeah. just published mm -hmm. in, in Nature Manol, right? Yes, exactly. So, so the group of Carlo Ferrari uh, has, uh, has done a very nice study published in, in Nature Medicine um, showing that the uh, exhausted T cells have actually a profound uh, alteration of their metabolism uh, and, and especially the mitochondrial function and proteasomal functions are, are, are altered in, in these cells. So now they, they said, well, can we manipulate that and can we restore uh, the, the function of these T cells um, and they look at polyphenolic compounds, uh, for instance, resveratrol and olopropane. And they, they, what they showed is that these compounds can uh, improve the mitochondrial function of uh, exhausted T cells, but also restore uh, T cell activity against the virus. So, so this is really interesting because we, we see that basic science may at some point translate to some new perspective in uh, immunotherapy. And then there were obviously studies on novel antiviral drugs. Uh, so you, you know that uh, all the steps of our life cycles now are, are uh, studied for, to identify new drugs. And um, we have seen interesting presentations, um, especially on the uh, improvement of existing uh, drugs, so nucleotide analogs, tenofovir, so TDF with, with uh, um, a prodrug which is called tenofovir alafenamid or TAF. Uh, and now they, they were studies presented by um, Dr. Brunetto um, looking at the efficacy and safety after two years, 96 weeks, compared to, to, uh, to TDF. And they, they showed uh, a non inferiority uh, in terms of. Uh, Vowel suppression, and they showed very interesting results in terms of safety uh, regarding um, uh, the kidney function and uh, bone, bone, uh, bone density and bone metabolism, uh, suggesting that uh, T TDF, by providing less exposure to the active compound, uh, will have less side effects in terms of kidney and, and, uh, and bone. So. Now we, everybody is hoping to, to have access to, to the drug. I, I heard that in Germany uh, you, you yeah. already have access to it. Since few days, basically, or two weeks, uh, it's now officially available in the country. So for us, it's a question now, uh, which patient should receive TAF? 
whom can we maintain on TDF. Uh, and uh, so this is an uh, ongoing debate right now, but I think this data really shows if you have a patient that has risk for kidney failure that uh, is above the age of 60, which is highlighted in the guidelines, for example, then this may be candidates, but we have an alternative. And there were, in interestingly, some um, uh, other compounds, um, uh, prodrugs of tenofovir, like tenofovir exalidex, that was uh, uh, presented as a phase 1v one, one study. They, they did um, uh, all the uh, pharmacokinetics uh, in LC volunteers and, and patients, and they showed uh, data uh, of activity um, in, in the phase 1b study uh, showing uh, 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 um, a dose-dependent uh, antiviral effect after, uh, after four weeks of uh, administration. So which, uh, again, uh, opened perspective uh, for, for development of, uh, uh, of new strategies uh, for HPV. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, uh, nucleoside, nucleotide analogs is uh, uh, Bezifovir dipivoxyl maleate. Uh, there were some phase two uh, studies presented in the past. Um, so now there were phase three studies um, uh, comparing the, the activity of bezifovir versus uh, tenofovir. Um, so we, we have seen um, the first uh, results at the, uh, at during the meeting um, at week 48 comparing bezifovir and tenofovir. So in terms of um, antiviral activity, viral suppression, uh, bezifovir was non-inferior to, to tenofovir, um, and uh, uh, it was well correlated and had a comparable safety profile to, uh, to tenofovir, uh, especially a good profile in terms of uh, uh, bone uh, density, nephrotoxicity, and histological response. So again, an, a new drug uh, coming um, which is good in, to, to have more drugs in, in the uh, armamentum in, for, for HPV. And really now, new drugs, new drugs, capsid inhibitors. Mm -hmm. So we've heard a lot about capsid inhibitors. Now there were a, a new one, uh, um, the G GLS-4, uh, which is a, a new dehydropyrimidine uh, compound, uh, a, a derivative of the Bayer, uh, former Bayer compound, uh, which was stopped so, some years ago. Now they did uh, a very nice uh, uh, phase 1b study um, where they showed uh, quite uh, remarkable uh, vowel suppression, dose dependent, and, uh, um, and it was really uh, interesting because we could see uh, uh, in some patients up to four or five log decrees of uh, HPV DNA, which was not seen before in the first phase 1b clinical trials with, with other capsid inhibitors. I don't know what you, you think no, about it, it. It's quite remarkable and, and, and four weeks dosing and, and you can see some of the patients even maintained lower viral loads after treatment. Uh, we have to see uh, how long this will be maintained but certainly I think it's important whether this compound will make it we don't know but I think it's a very nice proof of concept that the class is targetable and that this class of compounds uh, may have a future in my view. Exactly. And there were uh, also other um, strategies that were presented uh, during the meeting, um, uh, especially siRNA. So we, we all know about the uh, um, uh, studies from uh, uh, Arrowhead with ARC520. Uh, so we know that the, uh, the, st the studies are, are, uh, have been put on old uh, because of some effect in, in, uh, uh, in animal models with the uh, uh, many linked to the delivery system, not to the uh, active uh, compound. So they, they presented here an, an, a nice uh, study which was a follow-up of, uh, of the previous studies where there was only a single dose administration uh, of the siRNA in uh, patients who were on, on, on Tecavir. And now they did um, a repeated uh, administration of the siRNA, and they showed uh, very nicely that in EE positive patients, um, the uh, uh, continuation uh, of administration of siRNA uh, allowed uh, a more profound uh, uh, suppression of HBS antigen in serum uh, of 
if you start from the beginning of the trial, to, it's almost three logs uh, in some patients. For the others, it's two logs, um, which is something very interesting. In the e-antigen negative patients, it will be different. So the, the um, uh, decline is approximately one log after the uh, repeated administration. And this is thought to be linked to um, integrated sequences that alter the, uh, um, uh, the transcripts. But I think this approach uh, still needs to be considered uh, because this is a way to lower the antigenemia that may be important in the future for immune restoration. Yeah. And durability of response is also interesting. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and there were also uh, interesting combination uh, studies uh, uh, that, were, that were shown, uh, vaccine therapy with tenofovir. Um, uh, and uh, here in, in that study, uh, the uh, um, uh, tenofovir was used as a control arm and the um, vaccine ther therap uh, therapeutic vaccine from Gilead and Globimmune was added to tenofovir at the, at the beginning uh, of the treatment. Um, and um, the, the group of uh, Carlo Ferrari has done an extensive immunologic analysis and the, the results showed that uh, the, when you combine the therapeutic vaccine with, with tenofovir, uh, you can improve the HBV-specific T-cell responses. Um, the effect of the vac vaccination was mainly prevalent on the CD8 T-cells. But um, this significant improvement of, of T-cell responses was, however, insufficient to uh, decrease HBS antigens significantly. So we will need something else to, to decrease and ach HBS and uh, uh, achieve HBS clearance. Uh, then there was a, also a very interesting uh, study, some pilot study. Uh, everybody uh, is obviously asking the question and uh, we have checkpoint inhibitors for, for cancers, many cancers. So uh, it is inducing uh, re restoration of immune responses. So what's happening in, a, in, in viral infections? Um, so here in that uh, pilot study, which has been performed in New Zealand, <laughs> in New Zealand, yeah, by Ed Gain, yeah, uh, as usual, as usual. So we we are uh, we, we need to congratulate the uh, New yeah. Zealand team because it's providing a lot of information. So nivolumab, uh, anti PD one uh, antibody, was um, given at single dose, very low dose, 0.1 or 0.3 milligram per kilogram. Um, alone or in combination with the uh, therapeutic vaccine that we just uh, heard about. And they look at the um, uh, effect on the viral uh, uh, antigen and HBS antigen. Uh, and you can see that at week uh, 24, uh, uh, clearly you, you need to have the highest dose of nivolumab uh, because the lowest dose didn't work. Uh, and then the question is whether you, the, the combination with the, the, the therapeutic vaccine is providing uh, uh, an added benefit uh, or not. Uh, it's still a, a small study. What was reassuring that they, they didn't see adverse effect. Mm -hmm. um, now we have to see if we can repeat dosing or if we can increase uh, the dosage. But that's interesting concept uh, of combination. Uh, with nukes, um, checkpoint inhibitors, and a therapeutic vaccine. So hepatitis B was quite interesting, uh, and in particular, new stuff and new hope for new targets, right? So HBV is the future? HBV, yes, is the future, and we need to continue efforts to, uh, to find a new strategy to cure the infection. We have so many patients that remain at risk of HCC development worldwide. Uh, so there's one subgroup of hepatitis B patient at particular risk. And this is the guys who have a co-infection with Delta. So Ex Fabian, what's exactly. new on Delta? So there were interesting presentation on, on, on Delta. So you see that the field is really um, uh, evolving fast. Uh, so you, you, you know that we, you, we have entry inhibitors, uh, especially the Mirclodex. So there were some studies uh, published in recently la last year in Journal of Hepatology. Uh, we have um, also uh, prenylation uh, inhibitors, or lunafanib, uh, so, and we, we'll show some data. There were four studies uh, presented at the meeting, uh, and uh, there are also some um, other mechanisms with nucleic acid polymers 
uh, that is supposed to inhibit viral export. And there was a, a, a nice poster, lead breaker poster presentation on, uh, this, uh, on this compound. So regarding lonafanib, uh, four studies were, were presented. So here it's uh, um, uh, the idea of this uh, program, clinical development program, is to identify the right dose, regimen, uh, and see whether we can combine with interferon. Mm -hmm. um, so for sake of time, we'll present one, one of these studies. Uh, it was presented by uh, Xian Yodedin, um, where they, they look at uh, um, uh, different doses of lonafanib uh, with uh, ritonavir boosting for 12 or uh, 24, 48 weeks. Uh, so either all oral combination or a triple combination with pegylated interferon. Um, so we, we have seen um, uh, preliminary data, uh, not the full analysis, but still it's very interesting just to as a take-home message here, is that the uh, a triple combination with lonafanib 25 milligram plus ritonavir and interferon, when you look at the uh, week 24 uh, uh, administration, end of treatment, you see that um, three to four uh, out of five patients uh, have a strong uh, response in terms of HDV RNA, and at week 48, for those who were treated for 48 weeks, two out of three patients get this very significant response. Obviously, it's small studies, mm -hmm. but very promising because we haven't seen this type of results uh, so far. So obviously, we have to, to take into consideration uh, side effects and so on. But all this program I is meant to, to find the right dosage that we will be uh, effective and safe. So really some promising uh, studies in, in the field of Delta. Yeah. Some hope for the patients with HDV. Exactly. So, and I think people should keep, keep this in mind and, that, uh, and be aware whether there, there are some trials in their country so that they, they propose the, the enrollment in, in clinical trials. So this was A, B, D, E. And now C. Uh, now C. So, so is it finished or? or H Do we have some more uh, insight with, with the new combinations? Are there still some difficulties in some, uh, some patients' uh, population? Uh, wh what did you see at, uh, at EASL ILC? So I think it, it's very important to note that uh, we have now good treatments. We will discuss this in a minute. But still, HCV is killing many, many patients worldwide. And uh, we had uh, the WHO presentation at this meeting, launching again the viral hepatitis goal to eliminate, uh, 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 let's say, morbidity and from hepatitis until 2030. And HCV is still a major killer. And uh, there are uh, public health issues, but there are also medical issues. And the good thing is that we have now the tools to target the virus. And um, all of you are aware that these targets are direct acting antivirals, uh, targeting the proteases, the polymerase, and the NS5A protein of HCV. And um, we have seen last year data uh, for these regimens shown on this slide. And um, at this meeting, we have now more data and more regimens will be approved later this year. So um, after this meeting, we have a quite uh, extensive combination of compounds, um, dual therapies, triple therapies, um, which obviously raises a question, what to use when? What do we see at this meeting? And in this um, debrief, we cannot summarize everything. But what was interesting during that meeting, that the uh, easel has developed uh, uh, an application, an app, to, to help clinicians to, to, to make the right choice for Absolutely. For when you look at this slide uh, with these many options, uh, who can remember when to use the drug for 8, 12 weeks, when to add Riba, um, what do I need to do if there are kidney problems, etc., uh, and the genotypes and resistance. It's getting complicated. Um, and uh, obviously, it's good that Easel has developed this app, which supports physicians in choosing the right application. Still, you have to consider your local regulations and reimbursement issues, but I think this really helps. The important thing is that um, these drugs work. We know from pivotal phase three studies, but 
at this conference there were many real-world data presented and this is reassuring that the drugs really work that they are safe. We also have seen very important so-called integrated analysis um, of um, combined uh, uh, cohorts of phase three studies, which is important, which gives insight into subgroups uh, which we may have not yet uh, recognized so far. And we have seen phase two and phase three data um, for time reasons, obviously we cannot go into detail, um, but this is just a selection of phase 3 data, for example, for glesaprevir, pibrentasvir, um, but also uh, for other regimens, elbasvir, grazoprevir, uh, we have seen uh, phase 3 data. Very interesting, all over the messages, they all work and they are all uh, safe in terms of side effects, which is again fantastic for the patients. And when we say work is almost 100% Absolutely. SVR, and, thi and this has been confirmed in, in these uh, huge real world cohorts. So we have data from the US, from France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Scotland, Sicily, all presented at this meeting and we have to congratulate our colleagues in each of these countries um, that they have been able to collect these data, not only of of 50 patients, 100 patients, but of 5,000 patients, of 10,000 patients. I think this is uh, really remarkable. What is the, the importance of these real world studies that we now have also insights for subgroups that, which have not been covered in pivotal phase three studies. Just one example, um, HCV related lymphoproliferative disorders and cryoglobulinemia, uh, frequently excluded from the trials. Uh, and we have seen data from Italy, we have seen data from France uh, that the drug works in terms of HCV elimination, which was to be expected. But the key question is, what's about the extra hepatic symptoms in this respect? And quite frankly, Fabien, I was surprised seeing uh, these data that the clinical symptoms of vasculitis, of control of, of cancer, of lymphoma, was uh, in an order uh, above 70, 80 percent, which is fantastic, right, for the yeah, patient? This is, I, know, I mean, this is really inc incredible. I mean, to, to see um, that we not only achieve SVR, but also in improvement in the, in the outcome, patients with vasculitis or, or B cell lymphoma, I mean, they, they are suffering a, a lot, and we can see this improvement. This is really uh, a major, major progress. I, I completely agree. Now we have to talk to our colleagues, uh, the rheumatologists, the nephrologists, the uh, uh, neurological disorder people, that we really um, have to have these tools to help these patients. This is ignored in some of the other disciplines. Um, there have been, to my view, two phase three studies on subgroups of patients which we have neglected or there have been some debate. One is children. So, so uh, in the US, tenofovir is already approved for, for children from the uh, age of 12 to, to 17. And we have seen here now a phase three that study on the use of lidipasvir, sofosbuvir in children aged 6 to 11. Uh, for 12 to 17 year olds, they have been using full dose of both compounds. Here now, they used half dose. So it's basically half dose of lidipasvir, half dose of sofosbuvir, and it was a pretty large study for children. So um, overall 90 children were exposed to these compounds. Uh, only one child had a relapse that had already a cirrhosis. Um, and what was also in terms of safety obviously important, children, different metabolism, uh, how to dose this, um, that then when they looked at drug levels uh, with this half dosing, that this was exactly in line with data generated in adult and phase three studies. So uh, hopefully this will be uh, soon approved both by EMA and yes. FDA. And then we have for children also something so in hand. This is very important because this is filling a gap. I mean, we, we didn't know what to do yeah. with, with children waiting or, or <laughs> still being treated with interferon yeah. based treatment, which was kind of silly. Uh, now we have really good data. And consider the social consequences of having a child being sure. HCVR and a positive. So kindergarten, school, contact, sports, uh, and I think this is a major breakthrough. The other concern that emerged in, in the last years was what's about HPV. HBV co-infection. Again, HBV is coming back. Yeah, so we have we, we, we know that viruses can interact. So B may suppress C, uh, C may suppress B, and B and D we have these interactions, and there have been had been the concern if I cure C, that B may jump up and cause 
uh, even hepatic failures. And there have been, has been now a prospective trial um, in patients treated with Lidipasvir sofosbuvir in HBS antigen positive patients in Taiwan, obviously, 111 patients. Um, importantly, all of them had been HBS antigen positive. Uh, and one third, they have been carriers with undetectable HPV DNA, and then they applied um, again lidipasvir sofosbuvir. So the important point is that yes, HPV DNA increased in the majority of patients. However, clinical relapse with HPV DNA combined with ILT was very rare and very importantly, there was not a single patient that had jaundice, liver decompensation, liver failure or liver transplant and therefore I think this is good news. Uh, one can treat HPV co-infected patients. We should obviously monitor them but there's no major concern. So I think uh, an important study, well done, and takes away a little the, the, the concern that uh, DAA therapy may have uh, risks and side effects. And in any case, we, if there's reactivation, or we can treat them with nucleoside yep. analogs for HBV, or we can even do prevention uh, if necessary. Exactly, and, and the new ESA guidelines also give some specific recommendation for those of you who want to have a closer uh, let's say, uh, recommendation, go to the ESA clinical practice guidelines. So now there were a lot of debate about uh, DAA and the risk of HCC. So, so what happened at ESA? Do we, do we know more about it? Or? Yes. Ah. ESA gave the answer, <laughs> I have to say. As always. As it was, the, the last year was so much debate uh, and uh, it all, if you want to read the initial debate, it was the Journal of Hepatology, the October issue. There were data from Spain, from France, from Italy, from England, from Austria, uh, all on the issue of DAA and cancer. Uh, and uh, there were some controversies. And I think we first have to distinguish between de novo occurrence of HCCs versus recurrence um, in patients that had been cancer before and had received curative therapy. So two questions. Uh, if we start with the de novo incidence, there have been data from Sicily, from Scotland, uh, and this is data from Germany, from our center, which I picked here, that really there is no increased risk uh, for HCC. Uh, there's even a decline uh, after, in our cohort, after 400 days uh, that, that DAA patients did better. And this was confirmed also by a meta-analysis uh, led by the Australian group around um, uh, Greg Dorr also was involved here. So I think this is uh, pretty clear. There is no increased overall risk for HCC occurrence in patients with HCV cirrhosis. I think this has been answered. You agree with that one? I think yeah, it's, it's, it's clear. Sure. The debate is on recurrence. And everything started uh, with a paper from Barcelona, uh, published online uh, in J-Hepatol already a yeah. year ago. A year ago, yeah. a year ago. And at this meeting, the group is presenting follow-up data uh, on the same patients, which I think is very interesting. And they confirmed the particular aggressive pattern of HCCs in these patients. Uh, so it's not only that they occur early, but they have a rapid growth. Uh, and um, again, go to the um, ESA liver tree. You can watch this um, presentation um, online and then have a closer look uh, if you are interested in detailed individual courses. Still, there's controversy. Not everybody observed this. And again, we have a meta-analysis um, um, which uh, has been presented as a late-breaking poster uh, uh, summarizing data of several trials and overall these authors here did not suggest an increased risk for HCC recurrence in DAA treated patients but still I think Fabian to me this um, there's reassurance it's not a major risk but there is something and it may not be com we should not close this topic exactly. completely but on a practical point of view now if you have patients who, who is cirrhotic as a, an HCC that has been treated so would you treat with, with antivals, mm -hmm. with DA, or w what would you do? So, because uh, we know on the other hand yes. that the patients that have, have the risk also to, to die from, from liver Ab failure. No, absolutely. And I, comp I think, again, we are physicians. We have to talk to each individual patient. We may have to make personalized uh, decisions. Um, overall, obviously, this meeting reassures that you can treat. 
but considering the Barcelona day, we should watch carefully. This is my opinion. So lastly, and uh, this is obviously something which is emergent if we treat more and more patients, what's about retreatment? Even if the drugs work in 95% and 97%, they are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5% of failures. So this is obviously something we, we have to address in future. Um, there have been three regimens which were also presented um, at this meeting. Uh, two of them will hopefully be approved later this year in Europe, also by EMA. Uh, one is still in phase two um, from EBV, from Gilead, from Merck, uh, and they have been all addressing this issue of retreating previous DAA failures. Um, it's quite promising for the patients. Uh, this is the data for glesaprevir, pibrentasvir, um, patients that have been exposed to PIs, to NS5A uh, inhibitors. You can see here SVR rates of 91 and 89 percent with 12 or 16 weeks of therapy. If RASs were present at baseline on both uh, proteins, so NS3 and NS5A, then there were some issues with this regimen. I think this uh, would lead to the recommendation of doing RAS testing. Uh, an alternative may be the Gilead triple, Voxila, Previa, Sofospel, Via, Velpatasvia. Um, Christoph Sarasin presented an analysis of the importance of the RASs for this regimen. Uh, the key data had been presented at ASLD. Um, there was no impact of baseline RASs using this regimen and regarding the Merck regimen, Grasoprevir, Aprifosbevir, and Rusosvir, uh, we have seen a trial using this regimen for either 16 weeks in combination with ribavirin or 24 weeks, and all patients were cured here who took the drug, which I think is quite promising. Phase two will be interesting what will happen to this regimen, but at least there's hope for patients, and I think this is uh, the message we can give. Some patients may have a little wait, but hope is there. Very finally, and then we're closing this um, debrief. Uh, we have the wonderful new drugs, and can we use them to eliminate HCV in the end? What can we achieve? And, and there are interesting programs ongoing. We're seeing data from Iceland on this meeting. There is data from Georgia, uh, where it has been estimated um, how long will it take until HCV is gone, and will this lead also to a reduction uh, on in mortality? And there's modeling data um, uh, from Georgia and Bristol. And this is a little disappointing because even though you treat many patients in Georgia, the goal of reducing uh, mortality by 60% uh, is not reached with the current number of patients they've been treating. So this really highlights it's not only uh, treating patients, it's also identifying the right patients, uh, applying the right regimens, and treating simply as many patients as possible. And when we talk about as many patients as possible, we have to talk about prisons. We need special programs of bringing the drugs also to these vulnerable patients. Um, and in the prison setting, uh, we need, let's say, alternative management approaches. And I really liked uh, this presentation uh, from Melbourne or from, from Victoria, where they uh, went basically to the different prisons. And this was a nurse-led treatment program uh, supervised by hepatologists. Uh, and even in this setting, uh, where the uh, patients cannot escape, not everybody could be treated. Uh, this paper highlights also limitations, but opportunities. And I think this is uh, something where we have to have a closer eye on. We have to learn from experiences in different countries. And I think the Victoria guys did an excellent job and would be uh, great to see the long-term outcome. Yeah, and that's a very interesting concept to, to have the help of the nurses Absolutely. To, uh, and I think we should think of a really a, a integrated uh, management of patients in, yeah. that will include uh, all the professionals. I, uh, I completely agree. So Fabian, this was Easel ILC 2017. For those of you who are interested in some of these abstracts in more detail into the entire program, uh, watch the uh, Easel Liver Tree. It's a fantastic tool. Uh, all the posters have been uploaded, uh, e-posters, you can look into details. Uh, it's uh, different as compared to five, six, seven years ago. Uh, it's a good tool, but the question is, Fabien, what will happen to viral hepatitis next year, 2019, 2020? What is your projection? And it's, it's true regarding liver tree that since we couldn't, we, we couldn't show all the interesting yeah. uh, 
data here in, in this debrief, uh, the liver tree is a very useful tool to, yeah. to, to, to go through the whole presentations. So regarding the evolution, huh, very interesting. Um, I think um, hepatitis B will, will grow because that's uh, uh, including Delta, obviously. Uh, this, wi this will grow uh, because there's a lot of interest, new targets, new drugs, um, clinical trials ongoing. Um, so I think there's a, a, a dynamic there. Uh, for hepatitis C, I, I, I guess you, you agree with me, the story is not, is not finished. So Absolutely. There's a lot to, to do uh, in different uh, population of patients, um, whether it's uh, different groups of medical conditions, but also geographical area. Uh, we, we need to do more to, to, to be able to treat all, the, the whole population of infected patients. And also uh, scientifically, I think, uh, curing a virus, what does it do to the immune system, to the long-term environment? We discussed extra Metab metabolism. metabolism, extra hepatic manifestation. So I think we will still see many HCV presentations. And the other viruses, E e and A. will emerge. We should not forget them. Yeah. So to sum up, exciting times. Thank you very much, Fabian. It was fun yeah. discussing the easel ILC hepatitis um, topic. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. And um, uh, we wish you uh, a good future and enjoy the easel liver tree.